in life. Unfortunately, most of my relatives were either soldiers or sailors, and their idea of an artist was a little chap with a pointy beard and a beret spoke bad French. So that was out as a career. Uh, and then when I did get into academic uh, pursuits, I followed history and English. As everybody knows today, that's almost a guarantee of unemployment. So I really haven't done too well. But everywhere I went, I'd always made a practice of sketching, keeping up artwork, drawing, wherever I went. And usually anything I drew, I would make notes and research. It was always interesting. I know people with a camera, so it's certainly an illustrated diary. And uh, I had just finished one doing uh, work along the Labrador coast in the ship that I was in. So I was delighted when there was a job and offer from the provincial government to do some research and write about the military site at Penetanguishene. I think probably quite a lot of you have either visited or know about it. So I arrived there and I thought, this is marvelous. I can do all these sketches along the buildings and write about it. Unfortunately, I found the local chamber of commerce, they were looking for two things. They wanted the emphasis on the fur trade, Benetang machine's importance in the fur trade. And as I'm going to point out, it really did not affect Benetang machine. This is a bit of a myth. They didn't want to hear that. Uh, looking at the naval barracks, uh, I said, look, as a naval officer, I can tell you, uh, this was only a lieutenant's command. It's not important at all. It really of that time. Which was very important. Unfortunately, well, he lost the ship. Uh, and consequently, was court martialed. And I think you know the sequel to that. Following the court martial, he was sent to penitentiary. <laughs> so, the, uh, again, the Chamber of Commerce didn't want to hear that. But, I'm going to quote to you uh, one of the letters I did find, uh, written by Admiral Barry, you know, uh, Barry is named after him, and he was Captain Roberts' boss. And Barry says, I have just received a letter from Captain Roberts in which he bitterly laments the extreme drunken and profligate conduct which prevails throughout his paradise of penitentiary. <laughs> So, we didn't want to see that letter either. <laughs> and it was aggravated by the fact that there was another letter which said that Penetanguishene was the drunkenest post in the British Empire. Uh, that is a distinction of a sort that, well, again, wasn't the one they wanted to hear. <laughs> so, I didn't really do too much for Penetanguishene. But, all right. It's a bit of a run about story, but through Penetanguishene, because I thought, why would anybody in the census have a base at Penetanguishene? This led me back to Simcoe. And the more I became interested in Simcoe, it led to Young Street. And then, because the whole story unfolded, I got deeper and deeper into it. Uh, I have some pictures that I have here that I've done. Uh, you can see them, so look at them at the end if you like, rather than pass them around. I just ask you if some of the black and white, please don't get any moisture on them because they, it could smear. Anyway, <laughs> to get into Simcoe and Penetanguishene. Simcoe turned out to be a remarkably interesting individual because I was quite horrified to find that when I was working on Simcoe, as you know, the Simcoe Day on the 5th of August, uh, there was a lot of objection in Toronto to naming a day after Simcoe because they said Simcoe was not a good uh, example, not a good role model, I guess. They said he wasn't democratic, he was authoritarian, he stood for all the values that supposedly in North America people did not like. And I said, well, <laughs> tell you a few things about it. I said, first of all, Simcoe was over here to do a job, not to introduce reform. And you've got to remember that he was a product going into the army, and a point which most people seem to ignore, but I remember my school days, which is a bit out of sitcom, I must admit, but the British modeled everything on the Roman Empire, 
and Suko, if you follow through what he did, was very much in that school. And when I was going to school, the ancient Greeks, they were all right, they were keen on culture, they made sculptures, they had democracy, and all sorts of good things. But according to Oscar Wilde, they also tended to run around with no clothes on. So they were held up as a rather dodgy lot. And if you were going to run an empire, you followed the Roman pattern. And this is what Simcoe did. In 1791, uh, as you know, Upper Canada was created. It split with Upper Canada and what was that? Lower Canada. The choice in 1791 for the first lieutenant governor was John Graves Simcoe. Now, I feel sorry for Simcoe, because in spite of the Lord Simcoe Hotel, he never got so much as a knighthood. He was only a lieutenant colonel, and though his wife always referred in her diary to the colonel, the colonel says, he was also only the lieutenant governor, if not the full governor. And this is a point to remember, because the governor who was in Lower Canada, in Quebec, was Lord Dorchester. And this has some bearing on the way things turned out. Lord Dorchester uh, really was not too happy with Simcoe. Simcoe very nearly did not become the first lieutenant governor of Upper Canada. Lord Dorchester's choice was a man by the name of Sir John Johnson. And I don't know how to describe him to you. The best description I can give is that he'd be like a superintendent of Indian affairs. He was a chap who ran around and got all the treaties organized and signed, etc. He was Lord Dorchester's choice for lieutenant governor of Upper Canada. So you imagine Dorchester's feelings when Simcoe was appointed by the British government to be the lieutenant governor of this new province. And as we'll see, that caused quite a bit of friction. Now, I also pointed out that in spite of what people say about Simcoe, if it had not been for Simcoe, there might, might not have been an Upper Canada possibly no Toronto, and certainly no Young Street. He had very clear, firm ideas of what to do, and I think it's in his favor that he carried them out. Now, we must also remember that the American War of Independence was not long over. Simcoe had been wounded three times in the course of the fighting there, taken prisoner and escaped, and his health uh, it was quite bad as a result. As you know, in those days, if you were wounded, you might recover, but usually you suffered years afterwards. So, before he came out, Simcoe had developed a tremendous dislike and almost absolute detestation of the Americans and republicanism. He hated George Washington. He's the man and own natural avarice and vanity are the two principal ingredients in his character. Absolutely hated the man. You might also have been aware of the fact that George Washington had tried to get a commission in the British Army and been turned down. So, <clears throat> probably wasn't too happy with that, does it? Anyway, Simcoe arrived with some very clear ideas uh, of what he was going to do when he got to Upper Canada. Uh, his intention was that Upper Canada would be the bulwark, if you like, of defense. This was going to be, as I said, the bulwark of North America. Dorchester had other ideas, and this is interesting to think. They said, if anything happens, if the Americans or whoever push, if you have to fall back, give up Upper Canada, forget it, fall back on Quebec and defend Quebec and Lower Canada at all costs, because that is your link with the St. Lawrence and in turn the link with Europe. We have to hold it. Simply was determined to hold Upper Canada. So right there, there was a clash between him and Dorchester. Now, when Simcoe arrived, he said, now look, I don't know if you can visualize this, I haven't got a map, <clears throat> but you know where Oswego is? As you go along from Oswego to Niagara, we're in Niagara, then up the road to Detroit, and then from Detroit you go up to a place called Michelin Mackinac, or Mackinac, you know, these straits from, uh, you know, like you're on through into Lake Michigan. Remember Ma uh, Mackinac, I'll come to that again. <clears throat> Simcoe was interested in these because although these were all in American territory, which America claimed after the War of Independence, 
There were still British trading posts with British garrisons in all of these places. And Simcoe said, should we lose any of these posts, particularly Mackinac, the loss of Upper Canada ultimately, and not very remotely, must follow. These places, particularly Mackinac, have to be defended. Now, as you know, when he arrived, he arrived at where the British had uh, center of government, if you like, was for Upper Canada, was in Niagara. Some go to one, look at this lot, and he said, well, the Americans are just across the river. Can't have that. And he said, I don't like the name Niagara anyway, so he rechristened it, called it Newark. Now, you'll find Sunko does this. He scattered English names like Percy everywhere he went. Now, that was the first one. So he looked at Niagara and said, we, we don't want that. Now, you heard of Toronto, and he investigated that and was very impressed by it because of the natural harbor and the possibilities for defense. Simcoe, being Simcoe, wrote to the home government, explained, his letters were very voluminous, you read his correspondence, why he was going to take over Toronto. It was ideal. Now this is typical Simcoe, having decided it was ideal, he did it. Now this is Roman thinking again. Uh, in those days they tended to follow what you would call a Stoic philosophy. The Stoics believed if you see your duty, you do it. Never mind what anybody thinks. Whether it's popular, that's not the point. If you think it is right, you do it. Certainly not a democratic idea, but it can sometimes work. So Simcoe was determined to occupy Toronto. But he did. He arrived with his staff, his followers, and settled in Toronto. Lord Dorchester immediately wrote, I know not what is meant by this port in Upper Canada. He was furious. He, uh, Simcoe shouldn't have gone there. Uh, Simcoe immediately wrote to the home government and said he is making the recommendation of Toronto in his capacity as the civil governor of Upper Canada, not the military, which cut Lord Dorchester out, much to his annoyance. So here we are, Simcoe is established in Toronto with a group that I must mention here, the Queen's Rangers, and you've all heard of those. Now, they were specifically created by Simcoe. <coughs> Certainly the King, King George, gave the uh, so go ahead. But the idea was all Simcoe's. He might have hated American Republicanism, but he realized that the Americans in the woods were, they knew what they were doing, fighting. Plus they wore green, not red. So the Queen's Rangers had uh, a green uniform and so specifically raised, and this is interesting again, not only for military work, but to perform civil tasks in the province. Dorchester immediately said, this is another of Simcoe's provincial projects. <laughs> he didn't like this idea. I don't think the soldiers did either. They weren't too happy in sort of building things, but still, they were raised for that purpose and arrived in Canada at the same time as Simcoe, ready to go. So they were in Toronto with him when he arrived. I'd also point out that another interesting idea was the old Roman system. Again, that when these soldiers retired or were pensioned, they would settle in this new province and you had a ready-made militia, men who were trained soldiers. And they thought, so again, some good liked this idea. He also liked, as you know, the Roman idea of building roads. You know, the roads of Europe are covered with Roman roads, <laughs> well, the maps of Europe, and so is England. And I, as a little boy, I remember being shown the road that General Wade had built through the Scottish Highlands. It's still there and it's still evident. So this is very much a, a feature of British army thinking and thinking of the time. Let's build a road. And this is where Simcoe gets into the road building. Now, and maybe this is where the first trade touches on it obliquely. Simcoe had heard from a, a partner in the old Northwest Fur Company, a man by the name of Benjamin Frobisher, from the heard of him. Uh, I would also point out the Northwest Fur Company is not a company as we think of it today. It was a bunch of Scotsmen all interested in making a profit in fur trading. 
And because they had a common interest, they worked together based on Montreal. But it's not really a company. Now, this Benjamin Frobisher, what worried him was Detroit. Now, if I can explain briefly, uh, the fur trade routes of the time, the most dangerous, the fastest, the most successful, but the one where all the profits were made were the old Ottawa River route, and then the French River, and then up past the Little Current on to Michelin Mackinac, and finally to Fort William, what was now Thunder Bay. That's the quickest route. The cheap route was you come down uh, as far as Kingston, come across from Kingston to uh, Niagara, and then of course you know there was no locks in those days, they portaged over from Niagara into Lake Erie, from through Lake Erie up to Detroit, now on from Detroit up to Michelinacanac. Um, now, obviously you're dependent on supplies, and so Detroit was the big supply center for the staples, particularly corn, needed for fur traders. And of course the Americans, well they saw a good thing, they weren't going to get rid of it, but they had their fingers in the pie. Benjamin Frobisher was afraid that if the Americans decided to take over Detroit and push the British interests out, then they'd have to find an alternative. And Benjamin Frobisher had heard of this route from the Toronto, what's known as the old carrying place, which was around the mouth of the Humber. He somehow led north to this lac o clay, and from lac o clay, you could work up using the, the Severn River, Matchedash Bay, this connection to the upper lakes. Simca knew about this. Not because, and he became interested in it, not because he wanted to help the fur trade, but because he wanted some way of reaching the waters of the upper lakes. And this was backed up by Simcoe's acquaintance with another individual who showed up, very shaky child, and his name was Philippe de Rochebelard. He was a French aristocrat from a family of about 22 children. And he's not French Canadian, he's uh, from France. And for some reason he came over to fight for the British in the War of Independence uh, with the Americans. Uh, he was taken prisoner, and after his release, he arrived on Lord Dorchester's doorstep and said, look, I fought for you people and I've been taken prisoner. I'd like a grant of land. And the interesting thing is the stretch of land he wanted took in all of what is now the Rideau Waterway. <laughs> so Dorchester said, <laughs> on your way. No luck. So when Simcoe arrived, who should be again on his doorstep, but the rush of love, saying, look, you people owe me. And I said, no, okay. I would like, and what he wanted was all the land, including the Toronto carrying place. So Simcoe said, oh, no. <laughs> uh, but the idea was there, there was something in this. So to make a long story short, what happened was Simcoe set out from the mouth of the Humber, on horseback, with some of his staff and a few Queen's Rangers. And I think you all know basically the story. They traveled up northward as far as the nearest, I can say, part of the present day Kettleby. They seemed to have camped around there. And at that point, Simcoe met an Indian, uh, variously known as either Great Sail or Old Sail. I like Great Sail, because Old Sail's around with some bad pipe tobacco. <laughs> better trail running due south that will take you down to Toronto. So Simcoe remembered this. He pressed on. He went from Kettleby. They went down the uh, East Holland River, or the marsh, which means it was, by canoe, across Kempenfelt Bay, across now Lake Simcoe. He named it Lake Simcoe uh, in honor of his father, not himself. Uh, his father, incidentally, was uh, Captain Simcoe of the Royal Navy, who had died on the way to the Siege of Quebec. Uh, he died and was buried at sea off Fantacosti Island, in fact. So, after his father, Simcoe named Lake Simcoe. Do any of you know Point Francis at all up there on the lake? That is named after his son, Francis. 
Gwillenbury is named after his wife's father, Major Gwillen. So it's all these names are getting scattered. Simcoe gets up, he went up past, of course, the head of the Kuchiching, and then followed the Seven River route, which meant portage is done, until they got to you know, what is known as Machadash Bay, which Sim Simcoe promptly rechristened, called the Gloucester Bay. Uh, there was a, an independent trader in that area called Cowan, and that's a whole story in itself, uh, his background, but <clears throat> with his canoe and some of his Indian uh, work, uh, helpers or traders, they took Simcoe out towards Penetanguishene Harbor. And here again, I ran afoul. Penetanguishene, in spite of what they say, Simcoe never went into Penetanguishene Harbor, though it was too bad. I made a sketch here of a watercolor, but looking in the other direction, looking from Penetanguishene down the route where Simcoe would have come from. Simcoe did, from a canoe, he did see enough to decide that this would make an excellent harbor. And with that in mind, he also said, should we establish a base here, it will be called Gloucester. <coughs> he already got his mind made up. So on the way back, he came back the usual way down to cross Gamfold Bay, but then they followed the route suggested by Great Sail and followed this track all the way south. And there was some journey, if you read uh, Mrs. Simcoe's diary, they either got lost, nearly ran out of their rations, and they very nearly ended up eating Simcoe's dog, Jack Snap. It was a big Newfoundland dog, but I guess the dog was spared because, as luck would have it, somebody did see uh, the lake in the distance. So they did get back to Toronto quite safely. And Simcoe's mind was now made up. This was going to be the route. He also had another great idea for his defense in you know, Toronto. He said, let's establish a base, a capital, in fact, to be called, what else, London, on, of course, the River Thames, with Toronto. And uh, do you know where Long Point is on Lake Erie? You can establish a base there. And Simcoe's reason for doing this was, say, London, Long Point, and of course, Toronto, it's going to be very important because of the harbor. These were to be bases as Simcoe put it, to divide and control the Indians. Now there's the old Roman idea again, divide et impera, divide and conquer. Uh, Simcoe did not trust the Indians. And I would caution you, a lot of people say, oh, well, no, I said, no, no, no. The reason he didn't trust them, he respected them, actually liked the Indians a lot. His lack of trust was that if anything happened, any conflict, the Indians, very sensibly, would ally with whoever seemed to be having the upper hand. So he said, always be careful. If we seem to be losing, we're finished. They're not going to support us, you know, love or anything else. So we've got to show that we are in control. You must remember this when we come to Mitchell and Ackerman later. <clears throat> so anyway, without more ado, Simcoe then <clears throat> organized a survey of that route, <clears throat> which went as far as, uh, well, the Holland, Holland Marsh, the Holland Landing. Uh, when, when I deal with the history of Young Street, I only take it as far as Penetanguishing, because that was the original idea for a terminus, not really a river. It was not in the picture. <clears throat> so, some going mean, decided this, they surveyed the route, and when it was finished, they divided off into lots, and there's no route, but the survey line had been run, and lot number one started at where Eglinton Avenue is today. Not done in uh, sunny York. It was in uh, the area of Eglinton Avenue. Lot number one, and it ran up to lot number 111, 111 at Holland Landing. So then, having marked it off, Simcoe set about cutting, or having his Queen's Rangers cut the path. They weren't too happy at doing this, you know, the conditions were appalling. Uh, in fact, one of Simcoe's staff, when he heard that Mrs. Simcoe was saying that Colonel Simcoe was suffering very badly, you know, the Metro Toronto climate would like in, in those days, uh, the heat, it was 
mosquitoes and the, the Mississauga rattlers and the snakes. And this individual said, well, I serves I'm right for bringing us here. <laughs> no sympathy. You know, they liked it at Niagara. They, they hated me. Stationed at Toronto. But anyway, they, they got going, cutting the road. And when I say a road, I mean, you were just really marking trees and clearing a route north. And Dorchester got very huffy about this. Another of Simcoe's provincial projects. You know, the Queen's Rangers should be under the control of military authority. And Simcoe should be using the soldiers, you know, not sort of hacking trees. But Simcoe persevered. Although Dorchester did occasionally draw the troops off of something else. <clears throat> At the same time, Simcoe, and I'll mention this on, on by the way, there was an outfit known as the Provincial Marine. They operated the government vessels that supply the different posts on the lakes. And the people who manned them, they came were employed by the government and known as the Provincial Marine. Simcoe said, they are the most profligate men, set of men I ever clapped eyes on. And wrote to Dorchester and said, I won't have command of these people. I'm going to whack some military discipline into them. And Dorchester said, no. That was it. Simcoe never did get control of the Provincial Marine, in spite of what some people have said. He, he couldn't get his hands on them. So he carried on with the Queen's Rangers. Now, <clears throat> at this point, I'm afraid, there intervened the uh, war with France. The French, of course, you had the French Revolution spilled over into war in Europe. The French declared war in 1793, and of course, immediately, Dorchester never went to panic because they were afraid of trouble being stirred up by the French in the Americas and even stirring up the Indians in America to cause trouble in Upper Canada. So the Queen's Rangers were drawn off, many of them, to build a fort at a place called Fort Miami. That's not in Florida. It's at the west end of Lake Erie, where the Maumee River comes out into Lake Erie, but it's called my Fort Miami. And some didn't want to build the fort, but he was told to get on with it. The Rangers away. So having started cutting down the street, he's now stuck. He hasn't got people to do it. <laughs> and he had to turn to a very interesting individual called Berksy. Uh, his full name was William Albrecht Ulrich von Maul. Berksy, in fact, was a nickname, they think, was an abbreviation from Albrecht. There's not as many people think his surname. The name was von Maul. <clears throat> Now, this rather interesting individual <coughs> was employed uh, in the United States by a land company. Now, this is interesting. This land company, although it's American, was now independent, um, an English baronet, Sir William Pulteney, operated this company, employed a Scotsman as his agent in America, and this agent had hired Berksy who in turn had recruited a lot of followers who guaranteed to cut a road through the Genesee area. You know, that is in the northern states. Uh, these people were mainly from the ill German states, schleswig holstein some were Danish, a lot from Hamburg. So they were mainly German-speaking. Followed Berksy over to states. Berksy promptly got into trouble. I don't know the ins and outs of this, I mean, the two sides of the argument. Uh, one claim is that he didn't set, carry out uh, what he contracted to do, so he had arguments with uh, the agent, well, particularly over money. <clears throat> Simcoe got wind of this and loved it. He thought, yeah, now the Americans, now they're in trouble. Uh, who is this fellow, Berksy? So, I only found it rather interesting in some co correspondence. <clears throat> I'm quite prepared to stake that this happened. Simcoe's brigade major, a man by the name of Little Hales, who seems to have been sent by Simcoe into the States to contact Berksy. And say, Look, chum, we've got a better deal for you in Upper Canada. You want to come up here and clear the roads? 
So Bugsy was interested, but for the time being, nothing developed, except Bugsy got flung in jail uh, because of trouble with uh, the American authorities. Simca loved it. He's got a letter saying that I word that the agent Bugsy is in jail, and he just thought this was marvelous. Um, but he continued to entice Bugsy. Bugsy finally had a great falling out with the English land company and their agents and the American authorities. He decided to take up on Simcoe's offer. And the Berksy followers, they split into three groups. Some came along the lake, some went almost directly along the north shore of Niagara, and others followed the southern route. They split up so that the American authorities would be confused. And that way they made it from, they all got together at Niagara, across to Toronto. And it was there that Simcoe made his proposition that they, he would settle land upon them if they would agree to carry out road clearing duties. And we had in mind Young Street. And this Berksy agreed to do. Um, the only trouble I have is there's a problem here because I can't prove it definitely, but I think uh, from reading, trying to read between the lines, Berksy and Simcoe. They had one interview, and uh, Berksy came up with an alternative idea. You know, the German, what became the German Mills settlement in Markham. This is where Berksy's people got land. And Berksy said, why don't we follow the Rouge River? They called it the Nen in those days. The Rouge River, which runs down toward, I think it's Frenchman Bay, it comes out. And this will be an excellent uh, route, much better than this Young Street. Because you mentioned Simcoe's reaction to that. No way. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so there was obviously a bit of a falling out, I think, with Simcoe and Berksy, because Simcoe turned down the idea, and also at the same time started to renege on the grants of land to Berksy, because he said Berksy was not fulfilling his contract duties. And this is true. Although they were doing a terrific job of clearing the road. They ran into difficulties, which they simply didn't consider. The climate alone was a lot of sickness in amongst Berksy's followers. Uh, at one point, they were so close to starvation that Berksy went to the British government in Toronto. Well, incidentally, uh, some could have rechristened Toronto York by this time. So they came down to York. And Berksy had to mortgage his lands to get supplies from the British garrison to feed his people, flour and pork and beans and that sort of thing. So they were in serious trouble. And by this time, we're getting up to 1794, and I just read Simcoe's uh, letter on the subject. Simcoe wrote that Young Street was officially opened on the 26th of February in 1796. He said the road from York to the headwaters of Lake Huron has been opened by the soldiers. He never made any mention of Berksy. Most of Berksy's fellow followers, they, wanted, they had to give up their land because they didn't meet the contract obligations. Berksy went to England to try to get to a decision in his favor. He came back from England. That's quite a remarkable story. He was shipwrecked in Shedabucto Bay, made a journey on snowshoes that winter up to Montreal, where he managed to eke out a living as a portrait painter. He was actually a very skilled, very well-trained artist. And if you want one of the most realistic pictures of Simcoe, there's one that Berksy painted. He was a sick, sick man. And in fact, in 1796 is what happened. Simcoe, disappointed, I think, frustrated, asked to be relieved, allowed to return to England. As I say, Young Street had just been opened in February 1796. But 
by the Rangers. And the Berksy followers accept, they say, the Berksy people had to give up. They simply couldn't finish the job. And what was left for the Queen's Rangers simply was them to finish the road. So it was a rather sad Simcoe, I think, that left. Uh, Berksy in turn, uh, after several years in Montreal, later, at the time of the War of 1812, he turned up in New York. Nobody knows what he was doing down there. He died in strange circumstances, and the, one of the legends is that when his coffin was opened up, they found nothing but stones in it. So, what he was doing in, <laughs> in New York, nobody really knows. Suko was able to go back to 1796, left Upper Canada, disappointed man. The irony is that as his ship went down the St. Lawrence, it passed a ship coming up towards Upper Canada, carrying Sir John Johnson, the man who had left Upper Canada in a huff because he was not made Lieutenant Governor. And so Simcoe, as I say, left at that point, but he had succeeded in having the road cut, as I say, from the area of Edmonton Avenue to Holland Landing. With Simcoe gone, now Sir John Johnson unfortunately again missed out. He did not take over as the town governor. The man who took over from Simcoe was called Peter Russell, and he was given the title of administrator. And he was prepared to continue the building of the Young Street Road. But <coughs> <He> also <laughs> He also was not impressed with the way Simcoe had given out land grants to the UELs. Russell revised the list of UELs, cut many people off the list. Yes, he revised it. There was an awful ruckus over that. Especially, I found in the Russell papers in the archives uh, in Ontario a uh, note of grants of land to Peter Russell, from Peter Russell. <laughs> he, he certainly helped himself in quite, quite a splendid scale. Well, <laughs> he was, in his own way. Uh, actually, I might mention as an interesting aside, uh, so when I was in the archives, I also made great use of the Berksy papers, which are there, the originals. And I was talking to one of the uh, archivists there, and he said, you'd be interested in the fact that these papers were locked up by the provincial archivist during the Second World War, because they did not want it known that any Germans had anything to do with the development of Young Street. <laughs> so, <laughs> they were locked away until the end of the war. And some years after, I found that interesting. Now, anyway, to get back to Peter Russell, okay, he continued uh, using the Queen's Rangers again, um, but not very successfully. This. They didn't get paid, so they grumbled, and the notices of them, as they said, vanished to corrode on St. George's Day. They just kept on dumbing tools. And that was not a happy solution. And at this juncture, there's a rather interesting group of peers. I don't know if you've ever heard of them, the De Puce settlers. You see, there's a kid in a market to them on Young Street. Now, this Comte de Puce was a rather interesting individual. He's a French aristocrat with several followers, because they were <clears throat> lucky to get away from the French Revolution. They'd gone to England, and actually got together and they tried to invade the Channel Islands from England. And <laughs> that didn't work out. So then they went back and they spoke to Philip Old Wyndham, the Secretary for War, and they said, look, uh, possibly we could go to this upper Canada and settle there. So they put De Puce onto Simcoe, and as far as I know, Simcoe and De Puce actually met. Because De Puce suggested a scheme which Simcoe couldn't resist. He said, we will go out there. Many of my people are trained soldiers, which they were. 
He said, we'll go out, we'll be a ready militia for you there, and we'll also help to clear and build this road. Uh, Simcoe, because he just fell for that one. So did Wyndham, the Secretary for War, and the arrangements made that these people would be brought out to Upper Canada. Now, an interesting thing at this point is a Scottish merchant, a chap named Hamilton, wrote a memo to Peter Russell. And Peter Russell also agreed with this point of view. He said, look, you don't just come out and become a farmer. You plant a few potatoes and you're a farmer. They said, to be a farmer, you have to either be apprenticed to the system or grow up with the business of farming. These people haven't got a clue about farming. You know, you're making a big mistake. But no, they went ahead anyway. And the Pusey settlers came out. Uh, and unlike Berksy, they were given every assistance. They were given all sorts of supplies from the government stores. Help was given, and they did get a settlement established. So you know where it is, up really around the Oak Ridges area is about the closest, I would say. And they got a settlement going. <clears throat> but as predicted, no road clearing was done, nothing. In the end, they all, most of them, except for Michael Quentin and St. George, went back to France with the restoration of the monarchy there. Nothing was really achieved. So nothing seems to be coming to pass. There was a rumor at this point that the Northwest Fur Company would put up money for um, a road, or work on the road on Young Street. That, I'm afraid, is not true. It was reported in the newspapers of the day, but it was just a typical press rumor. Nothing happened. Not this company wasn't going to waste that kind of money. So Simcoe, or not Simcoe, the um, <coughs> authorities in Upper Canada now had to rely just <coughs> on settlers along Young Street to do the road clearing. And as part of their settlement duties, you know, to clear to the center of their, from their lot out to the center of the road. And path masters were appointed to try and keep these people doing it. But the road itself really did not come to very much until it got an impetus from, of all things, the War of 1812. And I think I mentioned Mitchell and now, just prior to the War of 1812, and this is where the Northwest Fur Company does come into it. They said, look, uh, we're going to have trouble with the Americans. It was even before the war broke out. They said, if anything happens, we've got to find an alternate route to Detroit. So they started again to look at a road that would go through as far as Penetanguishing. And for that, they did ask for several acres of land in that area. And they also wanted an area down in Willenbury where they could build a store. So this idea was now in the wind. They actually paid for the land, but they didn't receive title to it, as far as I could make out, until after the war of 1812. There's some doubt as to what happened there. But the Northwest Company was briefly interested. I think what was more important for <clears throat> the history of Young Street was that with the War of 1812, the British government finally came to realize that maybe some could have been right. Here was Mitchell Mackinac, which was garrisoned by the Americans. Mitchell Mackinac had, as some could predicted, been returned by the British, or given by the British, to the United States. And the British garrison was now on a little island called St. Joseph Island, which they all hated about as much as they would later hate Penetang. It's a tiny little island, and the Americans close by on Chilmackinac. <clears throat> now, when the war broke out, uh, I think, as you might know, the administrator in Upper Canada was General Brock. And General Brock didn't trust anybody. He felt that many of the settlers that had come up in Simcoe's time, and even some of the UELs, he felt their sympathy was more towards the Americans than towards the British. He felt he could not really rely on even the local militia, and sometimes even some of the members of the provincial legislature. So 
With the outbreak of war, Brock immediately decided <coughs> that Mitchell and Mackinac uh, had to be taken. <coughs> and it's interesting that the uh, <coughs> instructions for this had to go up Young Street, across Gappenfeld Bay, through what is present day Barry, and then they went from there across what is known as the Nine Mile Portage to an area that's now known as Willow Creek on the Nottawasaga River, down the Nottawasaga River to Lake Huron, across Lake Huron to Mitchell Mackinac. And the officer commanding the little British garrison at St. Joseph was a man called the Captain Roberts. No relation to this character I mentioned as an army captain, very junior rank. He got instructions from Brock who said, look, Mitchell and Mackinac is vital attack. And before uh, Roberts had really digested that, a letter must have come almost of the same uh, batch. A second letter saying, uh, I don't think that you should attack Mitchell and Mackinac. Hold. So here's a poor old Roberts. All right, not that. A few days later, a third uh, memo arrived saying, reference to Mitchell and Mackinac, please use your own judgment as to whether to attack or not. <laughs> so the solution to this was quite simple. Roberts was an Irishman. Uh, in fact, he was, I don't know if you've ever heard of the British Field Marshal, Lord Roberts. This Roberts was his uncle, Sean Roberts. So being honest, he attacked. And there was an incredible lot that descended on Mitchell and Mackinac. Roberts with a small British garrison. There's a character by the name of Toussaint Pothier, I think. Obviously, a voyageur of French guy. He turned up with 400 Indians. Oh my God, he showed up with these, all these Indians. And uh, a few fur traders from around the Sioux, uh, Sioux St. Louis area. And this lot descended on a great heap of Mitchell and Mackinac and captured it. Uh, so they were really delighted. They want a problem here, the Americans, as you know, as I explained in correspondence, getting any uh, instruction that it was difficult. The Americans hadn't heard the war broken out. So, I guess there's a sort of, sort of 19th century or 18th century Pearl Harbor, no, 19th century, I guess. So now the British have got Mitchell and Mackinac. So the British government also realized. No, we have to do something about this. We've got it. We've got to back up Roberts. We've got to get a tremendous force up there. How is it going to be done? So, the war's been going on for some time. Well, they actually got around to doing something. A man by the name of Tiger Dunlop, Dr. William Tiger Dunlop. He's got the name Tiger because, according to his life's his story, once he shot a tiger in India. And he was a, an army surgeon, a great big red-headed, bad-tempered Scotsman, and I was an incredible individual, uh, quite eccentric. Uh, he agreed, given some soldiers, he would clear a road to an attenguish. And this was agreed upon, but before this happened, there wasn't even any road to get up. And this is what prompted using William Dunlop. A detachment of troops, if you can believe it, under a man by the name of MacDowell, the Glengarry Light Infantry Fencibles. And he was an incredible individual, apparently, and I didn't rule by sheer personality and intimidation. He left Kingston in April. Now, this is April 1814. <laughs> what has been going on for some time? And he left Kingston with a party of shipwrights, 31 seamen, I mean about 31 seamen, uh, four small field pieces, 11 artillery men, and two companies of the Royal Newfoundland Regiment, <laughs> who were probably the best sailors of the lot. Anyway, this whole gaggle, if you like, arrived, came from Kingston down and got up. Uh, disembarked at Toronto or York. Imagine the mess it was in by that time. You remember the Americans had sacked York 
and uh, burned it. Yeah. Burned, yeah. So it's a pretty sorry mess. They arrived, and this whole lot marched up Young Street. They got to Kempenfelt Bay, and as near as I can understand it, they were lucky. It was still frozen over there. They were able to get across the ice. They got to what is well, present-day Barry in that area. Got off, went across the nine-mile portage to the Nottawasaga River. And on the banks of the Nottawasaga River, the shipwrights constructed 31 bateaux. Onto those bateaux, they loaded all the supplies, their guns, everything. And they somehow got those bateaux down the Nottawasaga River, literally cutting the branches along the way, along the riverbank, pushing until they got to Lake Huron. And they got this little armada across Lake Huron to Michilimackinac. An amazing performance. All right. They lost one bateau. But lost no stores and no people. They managed to transfer everything before the boat sank. So it was a remarkable achievement, which McDowell can take full credit. The only problem, the only problem was uh, that 31 seamen were under the charge of a lieutenant points of the Royal Navy. And when the, uh, the batter got off the lake on uh, Huron, Point said, right, McDowell, I'm now in command. I'm in charge. I'm a senior officer. I'm a naval officer. You're a soldier. And uh, he wanted to take charge of the entire operation. <laughs> so I think McDowell was simply flattened that one of the... You know, <laughs> he, he got very annoyed by it. So, but again, having done this, I say, here's this garrison. Tre tremendous feat. Impressed everybody. They're on Mitchell and Mackinac. But obviously, you can't keep going that route. So this is where... Go back to and then Tiger Dunlop comes on the scene with militia and troops. And he started in December 1814, pretty late in the day, to cut a route from, uh, do you know where the area of Shanty Bay is? Yeah. From Shanty Bay up to Penetanguishan. And that was the old Penetanguishan road. It's just a path with a few shacks along the way to give shelter. I say, Dunlop it was amazing, because he, being a Scotsman, he complained the whole time and said, you know, typical English, you know, they don't know how to do it. Give me a few options, I'd do it for half the cost and half the time. Uh, there's an illustration of this character, too. He and his brother, uh, who come out from Scotland, they shared a house, and it was the fashion of those days, they had a housekeeper who looked after him for them. And then they decided, it wouldn't it be more economical if one of them married the housekeeper? <laughs> so, that's yeah, not a bad idea, so they tossed a coin for it. Um, I'm not going to say who won and who lost, but um, the brother married the housekeeper and Dunlop went back to cutting roads. <laughs> so, uh, to him, as must give full credit for the success of cutting this road through a rough path, but it was through to penetanguishing in December. And I think I'm very bad on dates, but I think as most of you know, Christmas Eve, 1814, the war ended. And there they were. <laughs> the base they were going to establish at Penetanguishing, what's the point of it? They were actually planning, that's why they sent all these shipwrights up, they were actually planning to build a massive frigate that would be bigger than anything else on the lakes and would control, if you like, the upper lakes. They started building it, it was never finished. Another story, as many of you probably know, the big anchor at Holland Landing. Yeah. Well, I can't give anything definite on this. There are two stories. One is the anchor, which is massive, was designed and meant for this frigate being built at Penetanguishi. The party of sailors taking it up to Penetang, they got word the war was over, and they downed tools and left it at Holland Landing. <laughs> I don't know. There's another story, uh, years later, they did have a, as you know, they had a naval base there. When they shut down the naval establishment, the story is that everything was put up for sale. And one of the items for sale was the large anchor. And whoever bought it, they confirmed they only got it as far as Holland Landing and decided enough was enough. <laughs> That's where it is. But two stories, and I must admit, I can't really give you the uh, definitive answer to that. 
So in the end, uh, Simcoe, I think, having justified the road, the Young Street, and the Tang Machine, and the base that was established there. Uh, it's interesting that with the peace, Mitchell and Mackinac was given back to the Americans. It's left the Indians just shaking their head. And said, what was all the fuss about? And even the island of St. Joseph that had the British garrison was given back to, or given to the Americans. The British moved to a little place called Drummond Island. And then in 1828, around that date, they decided to take the entire garrison from Drummond Island and move it to, guess where? Benetanguishi. And they built the military establishment there. Uh, it's interesting to note that Sir John Franklin, on his first Arctic uh, voyage, the one that he came back from, records traveling up Young Street and putting up overnight at the house of Mr. Robinson in Newmarket. And then from Newmarket, they followed up the route across Kenfell Bay and they took the nine mile boat out, in fact, through the Kenfell Road and carried on from there to the, to the upper lakes. Um, <clears throat> but they did, as I say, <clears throat> although the war had ended, a naval base, small base, was established at uh, kind of tank machine. The only people who seemed to have taken any notice of it were the Americans. They always kept complaining about this warlike and uh, belly curse establishment that the British had established at Penetanguishi. If you ever looked at the ships they had there, a couple of little gunboats, a wasp and a bee, and they literally rotted and sank at their moorings. Nobody ever used them. Captains looked ashore. Uh, nothing was ever done. And in the end, as I say, in 1828, the army decided to take over and they built the military, stone military barracks there and established themselves. As I say, the drunkenest person in the British Empire didn't seem to you know, have any function. And it was, in fact, only like a, in the army too, just a, a lieutenant commanded it. And uh, he must have had an appalling job with his people, I don't know if you know. And the tank machine at all, you know the church St. James on the lines. Uh, if you go in there, there are two plaques on the, the wall. There's a plaque to the memory of Lieutenant Glascott of I think the 44th Regiment. He'd gone into the local village one evening, got drunk, coming back, fell off his horse into a snowbank and froze to death. And there is his name. <laughs> Underneath that is a blank plaque. His companion also kept in company. He fell off his horse too, and was found frozen in the snowdrift. And the commanding officer of Penetanguishing decided he was going to die anyway. So they got the plaque ready and put it up, ready to be inscribed with his name. Well, the fellow was either designed to be shot or hung or something because he somehow survived. But the commanding officer decided to leave the blank blank as a warning to everybody else. <laughs> so there it was. Um, another incident, they, a lot of the settlers now that came in in that area, of course, were ex-veterans, settled in the Penetanguishing Road area, and were old pensioners, veterans. And <clears throat> There was continual trouble with them. They, they complained that the army was, you know, just treated them you know, like dogs almost forever, quarrels with them. <clears throat> and there's one classic story of uh, one of the little taverns that was set up on the, the old Penetanguishing Road. Uh, one soldier got drunk there, and the story is he committed suicide, but he was buried at Penetang in the middle of the cricket pitch because one of the commanding officers thought that a good idea would be to have games there, and then nobody would go out and get drunk. He thought this was a way for keep up morale. So this time I got buried on the trip of pitch. A couple of his chums later got drunk again in the same tavern, and they came back, and they dug up this fellow from the cricket pitch and tried to take his head to the army surgeon in the barracks for his medical uh, research. <laughs> so, but, the surgeon said, no, I don't want it, thanks. <laughs> so they left with a head, and they couldn't have bothered re so they left it on the cricket pitch. <laughs> 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 the 
an incredible story to that place. And I said, it just went on, sort of, uh, really achieving nothing until 1859, you know, it became the reformatory. And I think that was the sort of the sad end to some good young street. It ended as that. Uh, I might, just as a footnote, add that when they took the garrison from Drummond Island to Penetanguishene, they came down in a boat called the Alice Hackett, I think it was. And uh, the only trouble was, they brought down all the voyageurs, the garrison, everybody connected with Drummond Island. The only trouble was, the fellow who ran the tavern on Drummond Island also brought along his supplies. So they were in royal shape by the time they got along way across Lake Huron. The entire lot, the boat smashed up on Fitzwilliam Island. Everything was lost except the people. They, saw them. they turned up and penetanguishing to this day, nobody quite knows how they made it. <laughs> they got there and established the, the garrison. Uh, and a lot of people today, you know, I find a penitentiary says, you know, the big French community of it, yeah? A lot of people say, oh, they're descended from the voyageurs. Uh, no, what really happened was the voyageurs took one look at this place and decided <laughs> Quebec was better and most of them took off. And it wasn't until 1838 the local priest in Penetanguishene actually encouraged settlers to come in from Quebec. These people were actually brought in from Quebec, most of them. And that's a nice story of Penetanguishene. I think all the voyageurs and the stories of the fur trade. Obviously, there will be a few, but there's not very many. Most of them left. So there we were. I think it was a rather sad end to, to Young Street. I think I was supposed to say something about the, the second one. Uh, oh, yeah. anyway, this, uh, <clears throat> very briefly, because it goes on. Uh, I, I took this first young chapter, 1860, because, uh, as you know, everything changed when the railway came through. Uh, you had, in 1867, of course, Confederation, and then Toronto was the capital. Everything began to change. The old guard, Simcoe's retinue, the people who thought like Simcoe died off. Notably Bishop Strong, who was determined that Upper Canada should be totally Anglican uh, because he lost out. The Methodists just swamped him. He tried, he, he did everything in his power to stop it, but he couldn't. So he died. That was the end of that particular era. And in the 1860s, is where I start, you got. Young Street, the total antithesis of what Simcoe had wanted. As I told you at the beginning, he was very much a product of his class and times, and he did not like merchants or tradespeople. I might just mention here, the idea that he liked the Northwest Fur Company was interested in it. Uh -uh. Simcoe's idea for the fur trade was that the Indians would bring the furs to his sectors on Young Street to trade. Nothing to do with fur companies. He was just interested in his road and the Indians trading his people, and that was it. But by 1860, Young Street in the city area had become very much a commercial street. <clears throat> and what I deal with is the incredible number of names that showed all Scots, almost without fail, the Scots made a fortune on Young Street. You know, Timothy Eaton, he was Irish, but his forebears came from Scotland. Robert Simpson, who was Scottish, who came out and started in Newmarket and then went down into Toronto. William McMaster, who was an Irishman, started on Young Street. John Ross Robertson, his father, the original, the original J.R. Robinson, he started a store on Young Street. Uh, a character by the name of John MacDonald, Senator. John MacDonald, who was the only uh, liberal ever to be appointed to the Senate by Sir John A. He made an absolute bundle on Young Street with his store. And I don't know if you know the area downtown Toronto, De La Salle School. That was his home, Oakland. He built that place. Imagine me. Out of his money he made on Young Street. It's an ironic uh, note that after he died, uh, Oakland was taken over by a Miss McCormack, who belonged to the uh, American you know, the Agricultural Implements, McCormack Reapers. Oh, yeah. She bought the place. Yeah, that's right. Take it off. Watching you blow that thing. 
Anyway, sold it to Miss McCormick, and she established an entire Negro orchestra on the premises permanently. What McDonald about that? I don't know. Because he, he actually hated cigars, opera, good clothes, cabs, everything. And violently, he was very much in favor of the temperance movement. But he certainly made us a fortune. The interesting thing is that when he sold out, he sold his store to a man by the name of Marmaduke Pearson, great grandfather of Lester B. Pearson. Started his store on, and he was another, they came from Dublin, but again, Scottish origins. So, this is what I started with in the second part is how Young Street became very much the commercial street. But it never quite made it, it was always mm, a bit iffy. They had some grandiose buildings, and they had some awful dumps. There was a place called the Gardener's Arms. It was so bad in the 1870s, it wasn't even in the street directory. But it existed just below Charles Street. You know, uh, no Charles Street, below, below. And it was still standing in 1922. The, the remains of it, it had become a blacksmith's so, so shed by that time. What a dump it was. <laughs> so I, I take all and describe all these various uh, places some of the homes, a lot of the people. And then another very successful Scotsman, I don't know if you know, remember the name, John Cato. Uh, he was uh, very much uh, a success on Young Street. Of course, you know the fashion of the street was always King Street. If they made a pile on Young Street, most of them tried to get onto King Street. <laughs> but, so I trace a lot of uh, the movements there. Uh, and then, of course, the northward expansion. What I've done is you come up, because this ties in with the, uh, <coughs> the Metropolitan Street Railway and finally the electric streetcar and all the trials and tribulations and uh, the problems there. And as you come up, take in, <coughs> obviously, Yorkville, you know, Joseph Bloor's old creation. It nearly became known as Bloorville, actually. But uh, somebody decided no, no. So they left Bloor Street. Decided against plural. So I take in all these up as you come up from Yorkville, then you have Davisville, and Eglinton, and they're all slowly absorbed. And I do make some mention of places like Barry and Penetang Machine as it latterly became, just as an adjunct to Young Street. Uh, it's not quite as exciting as the first one because under all the military activity. Uh, the only military activity had, of course, were parades on it, and I end in 1939 with uh, the visit of the King and Queen. And when you read that account, compared with the reaction to today, it was amazing. I mean, that crowd just went berserk. Yeah. And it was an interesting story, as they, of course, the lot of military panoply, you had a naval and royal, a royal Air Force band, a naval military guard, the Royal Dragoons were out. This cavalcade went down Young Street. All the veterans were out you know, down the road. There's one solitary character standing there with a flag for world peace. <laughs> and all the veterans are yelling, tear it down, tear it down, get rid of the bum, throw them out. And uh, it's interesting, uh, uh, Amonti, noticing this, quietly walked over to the fellow and said, look, uh, you know, you, I appreciate you got this up, but uh, you're really spoiling the view of a lot of these people who have been here for, you know, very early, and uh, it's too bad. And the father said, yeah, okay, that's all you feel about it. Full of the flag. <laughs> very nicely handled, though. Flag today. <laughs> but, uh, so that's really what I've dealt with, just describing the place along the way. And, uh, uh, and again, the people. Uh, because I think back, we're starting back in history sometimes, as I go through the different places, incidents that, that did occur. For instance, the Holland Landing, where the fellow called Blackstone got punched out and killed one night in a drunken brawl. He was an incredible individual. He was a lawyer who lived there. He had the only, was a, I think it was a tin roofed house. Supposed to have stood for years in the area around Holland Landing. And some say it's still there. <laughs> Yeah, there's quite a story connected with that one. Um, and of course, there's a lot of uh, 
as I said, with the Metropolitan Street Railway, I did a lot with the transition from the stagecoach to the street railway, and then, of course, to the automobile. And that, uh, what I've done, I miss out the actual war years. I end the uh, take the declaration of war, and First World War, and then, of course, jump to the years after the war. Again, an interesting comparison is the uh, notice when they saw on Young Street the, the notice of Britain's declaration of war in 1914. Absolute pandemonium. Parties, bands, Royal Britannia, flags waving. Everybody thought it was a great thing. Uh, compare it with the uh, notice coming out in 1939. Uh, crowds totally just depressed. Well, I say depressed, but very, very glum. Grim. All these, these transitions that you see coming you know, from sort of the all excitement of the, the First World War. Uh, an interesting thing was, too, uh, the, uh, I mentioned this was the, the automobile. There's a, an ad in one of the old Globe and Mails with pretty dubious statistics convincing farmers that if you buy an automobile, using gas, you'll save up all the, using so many horses. These horses eat so much feed. Now by saving on these horses, you'll save on the feed, and this will help the war effort. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty devious logic, but it's, it's amazing what, what comes up. So basically, those are the stories I've told with this one. I get a lot of it from newspapers, and it really is it's fascinating what you dig up. Uh, after the First World War, uh, you, know, you know they had a place in Davisville, and Davisville and Young was known as West Bank Corner, where all the veterans tended to congregate. And uh, they were all complaining that, uh, you know, they didn't want anybody coming in from Europe into the country. And the Honorable J. J. S. Rowell of the Privy Council, he made a speech, which I, I put it into the second volume because it's quite interesting. He said, too many Europeans have come into the country. And he said, what we want are people who are only prepared to be Canadians. And he got tremendous support. And there was actually a move to try and convince Europeans to go back to Europe. As they said, if Europe would have them, and after the war, there was an estate to have them. But to the attitudes, uh, <laughs> you'd be surprised at the, what got votes then. And got quite a difference in, in, in attitudes. Uh, I've tried to reflect a lot of that through the years. The best binge was the one held by the First World War veterans in 1938. Uh, they took over Young Street. Uh, when you read about it, you think of this happened today. Two of them were sitting there in a deck chair with an umbrella over their heads drinking beer at the Young and Queen Street intersection. Nobody would have sat there. Another pair, King and, King and Young, set up a florist stall selling daisies, saying they were flowers from France. <laughs> uh, two others tried to put a grand piano onto a streetcar. Didn't succeed, so then they took another one and burned it in the middle of the road. And uh, the best one, another two who tried it, I'm not sure it was even the store, one of the stores, they picked a small car off the street and tried to get it in, into the store. Well, they couldn't get it in, so they left it on the sidewalk. And uh, I was thinking, these things that happen today. <laughs> so this is what I've tried to do, is just tell again the story and as it develops. But mainly it's starting out, as I said, totally opposite from Simcoe's ideas. It becomes a commercial street and takes on from there, you know, expanding north. But I only, again, take as far as being a tango sheet, not really a river. <laughs> second book was because a, a lot there is a fair amount in there about York region and therefore since Newmarket is in York region and it, yes. it, is, uh, it really sort of traces traces the development of this yes. part of the country and uh, so that that's uh, that's the reason why I, I particularly liked it because it, it was both our home yes. hometown yes. and uh, and it's not just about Toronto uh, 
although, um, although all of the towns along the country are mentioned. Anyway, were, are there any other questions? I think uh, Gary had one. No. Do you know anything about Point Ford at all? As the northern end of the Everybody is trying to find the actual location of the Pine Ford. Well, Terry, Terry would talk about it. Have you found a map yet? Terry's looking for a map that actually shows that location. And, and when I came up with that survey, that was the first thing you looked at was uh, what did that, that survey say? And it says Willembury on that, on, uh, on that particular survey. So we, have you found anything? No. Well, it would be in the same vicinity as the anchor, wouldn't it, up there? Yes, well, we, we know, oh, well, if Terry can talk about it, but we all, everybody that is uh, in the East Willembury Historical Society and, and many people have looked at it, if you, if you, um, uh, when you, uh, if, if you were at Mike Filey's talk uh, a couple of weeks ago, he was talking about it because, uh, because uh, uh, Joy um, Davis, who is uh, the wife of, of uh, a fellow who is one of the original Davises from Davisville, uh, Joy Davis from, from East Willembury uh, took Mike Filey to, to that site to try to, to show him so that he could look from the Pine Fort down. And we all know where we all know where we think it is. Lot we, 111. It's what, Lot 111, which is the, which that pick, one the house with the picket fence, right? And I just took a picture of it uh, two days ago again uh, uh, from, from that particular angle. Uh, now I just just read somewhere where it said that that the maybe that wasn't the actual building that but parts of it were from the original pine fort were incorporated into that building. But it, it just doesn't. It, it just uh, we don't know what what is true evidence of that. I I really haven't been able to uh, to determine what would be a. Uh, would be evidence if it was written in a book and it, and it descri described its location. We don't know, Gary. And obviously, everybody is concerned about and trying to figure that out. What a reference made to it. Yeah. There were some other questions here. Yes. Uh, I was wondering what the uh, size of garrison, the Yankee garrison at uh, Mitchell Mackinac was before it was captured. It's just a small garrison. Garrison in those days could be as little as 30, 30 to 40. There were 400 Indians with them. Oh, yes, this was it. They were swamped. Oh, yes, that, that's what did it. They didn't think, for instance, uh, Roberts at uh, St. Joseph, his garrison was only about 40 to 50 troops. So he, on his own, probably couldn't have done it. 400 Indians got it. There was a lot of Paul? Yeah, was the uh, Johnson you were referring to? Uh, the Johnson John, John Johnson, yes. Yeah. Yeah. He was an old story. Yeah. 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 What about the uh, Mohawks? That, uh, John, didn't Johnson bring the Mohawks? Yes. <laughs> well, I'm not sure his wife was she Mohawk. I think so. I don't know. Because there was a long association with Johnson in the Mohawk Valley. Yeah. This gentleman has a question right here. Sir, how did the anchor, do I understand it was brought by ship and, it, and that it wasn't used? Is that how it got to the park? No, they, they, were, they were building the ship up there, yeah. up in the tank uh, The story to the origins of the anchor, nobody's quite sure where it could have come from. So the naval yard of those days was actually at Kingston. So there's always the possibility it could have been fabricated there and brought down, and now it's been taken up Young Street as the only route north. Up Young Street? Overland. Yep. 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 Oh. There was another route, you see, you could, because uh, you know the Don in those days was a lot bigger than it is today, you could yeah. get up the Don to about the present day New York Mills area, and then offload there and carry on up Young Street. They might have done that. But you're right, there's no, something else, there's no evidence of it. My guess would be Kingston. That's a good, uh, that's a good way. Yeah. <laughs> and not only that, but I, I just was reading just a, a short time ago that, that
that it was bigger than what the uh, the boat could have used. It was it was, uh, it was way way bigger than than uh, the ship that they were planning to put it on. So that's another thing that doesn't make sense. Like it just doesn't seem to. No, I don't forget the use of parts was bigger than the Victory, and the Victory could use that on landing anchor quite readily. The puzzle to me is how on earth they'd ever have a big enough forge to make that thing in Kingston. I rather suspect it was made in England, Scotland, and shipped over by water to a long, long pole. That's another one of those myths that, that uh, sometimes gets, gets dealt up and, and uh, created. Nobody knows where it came from. Is it? Uh, another, sorry, the other, where's Fort Miami? I've never been back before. Okay. Away at the west end of the lake here, okay, no. there's a Maumee River, M-A-U-M-E-E. Is there a town there, or near there, or is there a town near there? No, just Fort Miami was built. I, it's probably meant to be Fort Maumee, but it's now it's written as Fort Miami was built. It, 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 it wasn't retained as a site or anything after, it was just the end of the water. Okay. Yeah, was, uh, did you actually start, start at uh, Dundas? I might find you said you did. I saw the young tree. Lot number one was given to an ex Hessian officer, a man by the name of Frederick Baron de Hohen or Bonhoeffer. And he got a tremendous. The guy couldn't go on to say this. But he made a fortune of selling off his land because he had a speculator. Uh, a hut, a house at the corner, today young and negative. Some of his land he sold off, was bought by Mrs. Heath, who was the widow of Colonel Heath, who was killed in India. And that's the extent of the land he had, he sold off the parcel, it's right over to Heath Street. So was yeah. there another street that went down to the left of the area? No, there was a long roundabout route that went up what is the present day Parliament Street. And they would go up, I think you could ride up about as far as Castle Frank. And then there was a long route over Castle Frank to connect with Young. <laughs> it wasn't really until the early 1800s that the citizens of Toronto, as Chief Justice Elmsley, uh, Elmsley sorry, got together a petition to extend the road a young street down through York. And that was got up by what they called those a subscription. In other words, donation. So this is sort of a young street in the funny history. They started the survey from Homer Landing down to the area of Edmonton Avenue. And they started cutting the road from Edmonton Avenue up to Homer Landing. And then in the early 1800s, they pushed the road from Edmonton down. Yeah. Well, uh, Mr. Burton, uh, you know, we certainly bring us a lot of things to think about. We have the group of 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 the group